Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. Glad you could be here today. I'm going to invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 9. And while you do that, I'm thankful. By the way, did you all get your handouts today? No? Okay. I sent, I sent uh, Stephen to the, Terry's office. Terry's out today. That's probably why they didn't get passed out. But anyway, um, uh, I sent Stephen out there to round him up for us. And and Marilyn, if you could help him when he comes in with him, you could pass him out over here and he can get him out. That'll be great. And while we're waiting for that, uh, I'm going to thank everybody for all of your prayers and your kind words that you've sent in my direction, my family's direction. Uh, my sister Elaine, my oldest sister, she passed away this past Wednesday. And she, at the beginning of September, had just turned 65. She was... Um, just a, a, a wonderful sister. She was, I was very close to her. Um, she really battled hard against a very serious breast cancer for four years, but uh, she just uh, couldn't uh, continue any longer, and it was just very difficult. So did we get them, Marilyn? Okay, great. Mike, can you take half of those from her and help her on this side maybe? Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Marilyn, thank you. So again, I Flew up on Thursday night, got there late, 9 o'clock Thursday night, and got to spend the day all day Friday with my brother-in-law, Pat, who lost the love of his life. Uh, they were a little bit older than me, so I remember my brother-in-law, Pat, since I was about, I want to say, uh, let's see, about since I was 11 or 12 years old. That's how long I've known him, so a long, long time, about 50 years or so. And, um, and just before I left uh, yesterday morning to come back, he told me, he said, I lost the love of my life. And um, I can't disagree with that. I told him he took such good care of my sister. And so pray for Pat, Pat Halton, my brother-in-law. And I'm thankful my, brother, my younger brother, Patrick, got to be there. Uh, and his wife as well from Indianapolis. They came up and... So it was so good to see them as well. So again, thank you, everybody. And these times are never easy, but I'm thankful like these songs that we sing week after week, that God's love never gives up. God never, his love never changes. Thankfully, in this world where everything's shifting and changing and not always for the better, God's love is steadfast and sure and strong. All right, Daniel chapter 9. What basically we're doing this morning is we're picking up last week with these nine crucial uh, issues here that we find about the future, about the future. Very many of these nine. Not all of them, but most of them. And we did, I believe, three last week, and we're going to pick up with number four. But what we need to do first, of course, is to read God's word together. And we're going to read the same passage we read last week. I'm going to stop and make a few comments along the way, but we're going to start with verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. You'll notice 70 weeks are determined for your people in your holy city. So this is the angel Gabriel coming to Daniel, and he's telling him God's plans for the future. And he says, Daniel... Your people, Israel, 77s. Remember we said the, the word weeks wasn't really the best translation? It's really 77s. All we have to do is figure out what the sevens represent. And last week we talked about that. Do they represent days? Do they represent weeks? Do they represent months, years, decades? All right, we'll come back to that. But 70 we, uh, weeks, 77s are determined for your people and for your holy city, Jerusalem. Now, as we saw last week, this time period involves six prerequisites, six things that have to occur here that are all given in verse 24. To finish the transgression, Israel's rebellion will end. To make an end of sins, the people of Israel will finally and completely live holy lives before God. To make reconciliation for iniquity. That has to happen, Daniel. And Christ did that several hundred years later on the cross. 
John 1 29 he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world he made reconciliation for your sins and mine isn't that something that we ought to be shouting and praising him for today yes it is to bring in everlasting righteousness okay so this is another thing that must occur which is the eternal kingdom of the Lord Jesus righteousness everyone is going to cover the earth forever and ever first our earth that we live on for a thousand years then the new heaven and new earth now you all know I taught Revelation you all remember God's not going to live in heaven in eternity God the Father God the Son God the Spirit are going to live now I don't know how God the Father and God the Spirit are going to manifest themselves to us have no idea that's in God's hands and we don't know how he'll do that but the Bible tells us they'll all be here on the new earth and uh, Jesus will will live and rule from Jerusalem forever and ever and so God is going to be with man and we'll see him as he is it's going to be amazing so that's everlasting righteousness what's another prerequisite that must happen before Jesus uh, reigns on this earth well this the they're gonna seal up or we're gonna end God's gonna end vision and prophecy because Jesus will be with us personally visions and dreams won't be necessary anymore and then finally last week we said one of these prerequisites these six prerequisites is to anoint the most holy and of course you have to add the word place there to anoint the most holy place in the temple if you want to read all about that you could read the last eight chapters of Ezekiel man I mean it goes into detail about what that temple's going to be like on the top of Mount Zion and I mean it's amazing there's eight chapters given to it about all that's going to happen it talks about what it's going to look like how it's going to be built all the things that are going to happen and you know what everybody we're going to see that one day we're going to see that everybody is going to make a trek to Jerusalem and I don't know exactly how many times a year, but it's probably going to be more than one. But we're going to go there, and we're going to celebrate. It's going to be incredible. I mean, people right now that go to New Orleans for Mardi Gras, they're, they're, this is going to be so far beyond the glory and the happiness. There's not going to be crime. There's not going to be evil. There's not going to be things. I mean, this is going to be an incredible, wonderful thing. Now, the reason that this holy place will need to be anointed is, don't forget, the last three and a half years before Jesus returns to earth, the evil man of sin, who a lot of Bible scholars call the Antichrist, I call him the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, he's going to defile that temple. He is going to, to uh, go in there and declare that he's God right in the place in the Old Testament where God Almighty dwelt in that very room where God dwelt with his people uh, this man's gonna go in there and say I'm God well that's why we need a re-anointing when Jesus returns because that place has been defiled and God's going to restore its religious quote-unquote holiness okay he's gonna go in there it's a ceremonial thing Okay, that's just one verse. Woo! Boy, that's a whopper, isn't it? That's why it took us a whole sermon to do that. Okay, now, verse 25. Now, <laughs> Gabriel says to Daniel, Okay, Daniel, you get it. All these things must come to pass. Know, therefore. Therefore, know this, Daniel. Okay? That from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. How much is seven plus 62, everybody? 69. Very good. Now go to the back of the class. Only three of you could add 62 and seven. Oh, boy. Okay, we got to get you all some computers and get you signed up for some math. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, okay, so 69 weeks, okay, from... This decree in the Old Testament on a certain day, we're going to talk about that, to the day that Jesus rides the donkey into Jerusalem. That's when he's presenting himself as the, the Messiah of Israel. He's fulfilling Psalm 118. He's fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. 
He's presenting himself as Messiah the Prince. Okay? There is a time between here and here, and, and, and Gabriel said, Daniel, it's 69 weeks. Now, not in weeks as we think of them. We're going to come back to that. It's a time period. 69 sevens. Verse 26, or I'm sorry, let me continue. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. Verse 26. And, notice this, Gabriel tells Daniel, after the 62 weeks. Okay, question. This, I'm just throwing this out there. When does that 62 weeks end? Who can tell me? When does that 62 weeks end? It started with the command, and then it ends with what? Jesus is on Palm Sunday, the presentation of himself. That's the end of the 62 weeks. What happens after the 62 weeks? And after the 62 weeks, after it, after Palm Sunday, Messiah, where am I at here? I lost my place. There he is. Messiah shall be cut off. We could say today he will be crucified, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come. Now, this is not Prince Jesus. This is a different prince. We'll tell you who this is later. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war Desolations are determined. Then he, verse 27, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, there is it again. There it is again. For one seven. One unit of seven. Okay, you as student, students will know right away. You as student, Bible students will say, ah, the tribulation period. That one week of seven years. He shall confirm a covenant with many for seven years. But in the middle of the seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Okay, you know, if you, somebody makes something desolate, it's like a ghost town. <laughs> okay, you get that? Desolation. It's like a ghost town. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate, or literally the desolator. It's talking about the man of sin. Now, everybody, I know this is super duper complex. Everything we just talked about, about the future, your eyes start watering, your eyes, might, you might start batting your eyes. You're like, oh, this is too too hard to understand. Well, that's why I'm giving you these handouts. You can go back and study them. You can think it over. Okay? Now, this is the title that I've given. It's different from last week, and it's, I already mentioned it. But we're talking today about God's future plans for Israel. And we're going to continue those nine keys. Okay? Things are happening in our world, everybody. Uh, like I said last week, President Trump has brokered a peace deal between these Arab nations, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain. And by the way, he said recently seven more, and so it could be upwards of 10. This is very, very interesting. This is very, very uh, telling. I mean, we can be closer to the return of Christ than we even know. I don't know. Nobody knows, but we could be. Things are happening that are just unbelievable. So let's have a word of prayer, because we're going to need God's help to pull all this in again. Thankfully, you'll have your notes there. You could take them home, fill them in. But let's pray. Father, we ask that you'll use your word in our hearts. You didn't put this in the Bible just to put it in the Bible. You didn't put it in there, Father, just so that we could uh, say, oh, that's neat. You put it in there, Lord, because like we sang earlier, you want us to hear this. And to say, hey, I need to ready myself for the return of Jesus. You're holy, so I need to be holy, Lord. I need to be realizing that you could come in any minute. So, Father, help all of us. Lord, yours truly included, Father, help all of us today to walk out of here with a reverent and holy fear for you, Father, and for your holiness and your glory. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, Father.
Amen. All right, well, let's review. Real quickly, these first three were from last week, okay? You see them there in your notes? Number one, what are these nine keys to understanding this passage in the Bible? Well, last week we said, number one, it's about Daniel's people. It's a prophecy, a prediction of the future about Daniel's people, the Jews, and the holy city, Jerusalem, okay? That's number one, for your people and your holy city. Number two, it's 70 weeks. That's the amount of time. We said that it's 490 years. The amount of time covered is not 70 days. It's not 70 weeks as we... This is 77s. That word weeks is not correct. 77s. 77s of what? Last week we said 77s of years. 70 times 7. Remember Jesus? How many times should I forgive my brother? 7 times? No, 70 times 7. What is it? 490 times, Jesus says. Well, here, Gabriel and Daniel and God is talking about 490 years, not 490 days or anything other than 490 years. Okay, that's number 2. We looked at that. 490. Then we said these are these six things. The 490 years of prophecy would be necessary to accomplish the six things we talked about earlier. And there they are. There's all those verbs. To finish, to make an end, to make reconciliation, to bring in, to seal up, to anoint. Those things have to be accomplished before Jesus brings the kingdom to earth. We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. These six things in that verse right there have to happen before Thy kingdom comes. God's kingdom comes. All right? So that was what we looked at last week, okay? And you have your notes from last week. Now, let's do a few more of these. We can't get all nine ag done again because we have to take our time and walk through this. But let's look at these. Okay, number four. What is the historical starting point? Okay, what is the historical starting point? If you go back in history, what's the historical starting point of these 490 years. All right, well, it's there in verse 25. And I put it in, in, I highlighted it up here. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Okay, if you want to write this in here, historians have determined that this was basically, they have a artifact, uh, archeological find that if I'm not mistaken, has the very day and year which was as close as they can calculate, March 1st, 444 B.C., okay? The day that Artaxerxes commanded that, and if you'll notice, uh, down there I have a little, do you see that little chart there? Okay? The beginning of the 490 years over there on the left where it says 69 weeks is that decree of Artaxerxes. You could put there March 1st, 444 B.C. if you want, okay? That's as close as they can find to that very day that that king got up. Just like nowadays, if the president gets up and he makes a decree, it's written down, it's put in a computer, it's sealed. Man, I mean, you can go back. Historians could look at, like, every day of the presidency of this president, every day of the presidency of that president. They have those all, they used to do that in days of gone by in ancient times, but we just don't find very many of them, okay, because they, they corrode, they are destroyed, they are stolen, and they disappear, but they have, do have some. Okay, so number four, what's the historical starting point? It's the day that Artaxerxes, it's in Nehemiah chapter two, you could read it in the Bible, it doesn't have the date there, but it's got a general time frame there. But uh, that 69 weeks of the 70 started in 444 B.C. Now, number five, that you could put for number five, when did the 69 weeks end? Or when did Jesus present himself to the nation of Israel? Okay, that's also in verse 25. Okay, there's the, uh, the, the chart. I forgot I had that chart up here, <laughs> but you've got it. Okay, verse 25 says, it's from the command, the 69 weeks are from the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. When's Messiah the Prince? It's on your chart, Palm Sunday. Now notice, 
Palm Sunday is that little skinny line before the little cross I drew on there. I found, an, I found a little uh, thing that mimics a cross. It's actually some kind of symbol of some kind of thing, but it was the closest one I could find for a cross that I could quickly put in there. So notice, the cross is just a week after. That's why it's, I put it so close. It's just a week after Palm Sunday. And by the way, everybody, I call it Palm Sunday because that's what everybody else calls it, but actually, if you follow the chronology in the Gospels, it's really Palm Monday. <laughs> you can calculate it out that they actually made a mistake by, or people, scholars made a mistake by calling it Palm Sunday because you can put this scripture and this scripture and this scripture together. I don't have time to go into it, but you put those several scriptures together and they go, oh, well, he had to have an extra day of rest there, so he must have ridden in on the donkey. He must have rested on Sunday and had ridden the donkey in on Monday, okay? So maybe one day I'll have a whole message. We'll just talk about that and, and maybe on Palm Sunday sometime. Because I don't think I've ever gone into it. I've just mentioned that. But it's not, it's not that important. It is and it isn't, okay? But I just want you to know that you can keep it in the back of your head. Now let's look at that chart. So Jesus presented himself just before the crucifixion on Palm Sunday. Look at your chart. Now what happens? Um, Messiah is cut off on the day he's crucified. Messiah is cut off. He loses his life. By the way, I'm going to show you in just a minute. That's a word in the Old Testament, cut off. When they use that phrase in the Old Testament, like in Leviticus, it meant the death penalty. You'll be cut off from your people. Now notice, there's this massive time gap. Now it's been almost 2,000 years. In 2033, it'll be 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross. Almost 2,000 years. And you know, many of you may still, unless the Lord, if the Lord tarries is coming, you may be alive still. And you may be around on the day that the 2,000th anniversary of Jesus' death, but he may come way before that. We just don't know. But this current time gap, Gabriel doesn't come out to Daniel and say, oh, by the way, Daniel, there's this massive time gap in between here and between this part. And No, he doesn't tell him that. But as we are looking back, we're recognizing, hey, we got the 69 sevens, but where's that last, no, just one seven? One seven of years. Where's the last seven? Well, they, we know what it is from the Bible. When the rapture of the church occurs, look at your, look at your chart. When the rapture of the church occurs, um, right here, that was a miracle. I pushed the right button. <laughs> it should have shut off where we have to restart the whole thing. <laughs> but I got lucky there. Rapture of the church. Okay, we're waiting for the rapture where we'll all be taken up in the air to be with Jesus. And when that happens, everybody, then what we have is the last seven years. We've got the 483 prophetic years over here, and we're waiting for the last, three, or the last prophetic year, 360 days times seven, or 1,260 days plus 1,260 days. Or Revelation 2 verses, Revelation 11 verses 2 and 3, uh, 42 months, okay, and 42 months. Okay, so you get it, okay? So there's this giant time gap. This has already occurred the first 69 weeks, and we're still waiting for one more week, one more period of seven years, okay? Now, let me continue on here. Okay, so we know it's going, the end of the 69 years is ends with Messiah the Prince. You've seen that, okay? Now, I want to push point this out. I think I put this in your notes, everybody. But in your notes, does it say in your notes that Israel should have said, look, he is claiming to be our Messiah? Is that in your notes? Did I put that in there after number five? They should have said, look, he's claiming to be our Messiah, your Messiah. Did I happen to put that in there? I don't know if I did or not. Okay, well, just listen to what I'm going to say. How long did Israel have Daniel's prophecy? Hundreds of years. They're studying it and studying it and studying it. They should have looked and said, well, we know when Artaxerxes decreed 
the command. That happened here. And this is saying Messiah is coming after 69 sevens. Okay, if they thought the sevens were days, <laughs> seven times 69 days, 483 days, couldn't they have figured out if Messiah had come? They could have said after 483 days, nope, wasn't days. And if they said, okay, let's do months, 483 months. A few years later, nope, Messiah didn't come. The sevens aren't months. Oh, they must be years. They should have figured that out. They should have been able to read Daniel, but for whatever reason, their hearts are hard. They're not understanding scripture. They're not getting it. Okay, but they, listen, astute Bible students should have been able to read Daniel and say, okay, 69 times 7, 483, it's not days, we already figured that out, it's not weeks, we've already figured that out, it's not months, we've already figured that out, it must be years. So what should they have been doing around 33 AD when these 483? Three prophetic years. Now, it's different from solar years. If you add it up and say, hey, wait a minute, Pastor Bob. I went back to 444 and added 483 to that, and that only comes out to be like, you know, 26 AD. It's because those are prophetic years and not solar years. I wrote down, I got a note in my pocket here. Let's see. Solar years that you and I know today. Listen how long a solar year is. You say, I know how long it is, Pastor Bob. It's 365 days. Not exactly. A solar year is 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. So it's actually roughly 6 hours a year longer. Oh. Oh. So how often, how many, how often do we do leap year and have to add a day? Every four years, right? Why? Because a solar day a solar year isn't just 365 days. There's always six hours. 365 days, and I'm, I'm rounding up, 365 days and six hours. So watch this. Six hours, 12 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours. There's February 29. See? That's why if we don't, we'll get all out of whack. Our calendars are saying, oh, it's going to be a full moon. <laughs> and you're looking up there, and the calendar says full moon, and it's a half moon, and you're like, what? Well, that's why we have to have that, that leap year. We have to make a leap. We have to add an entire day because of that technicality, okay? Now, in the Bible, they didn't have that all calculated out. In fact, they saw years in the Bible as 360 days, period, 360 days. And that's what we're reading in Daniel. Okay, now, let me get a little technical here, and then we'll go on to the next one. If, the, if Jewish people took 483 years and they multiplied it by 360 days per year, which was their prophetic days, this is how many days, watch this, from the command to Palm Sunday, from the command in 444 BC to the day Jesus rode the donkey in in 33 AD, watch this, 483 times 360 days is 173,880 days. So I'll give it to you. You can write this down. I wrote it down. If the decree, as far as they know, is March 1st, 444 BC, if you add 173,880 days, it comes out to be March 30th, 33 AD. March 30th, 33 AD. That's exactly 173,880 days. And we can basically pinpoint the day that Jesus rode the donkey in and he got cut off. If it was Palm Monday, March 30th, how many days in March? 31? Okay. So then you've got, oh, I better not blow it here because let's see. If Monday was the 30th, Tuesday was the 31st, Wednesday's the 1st, Thursday's the 2nd, April 3rd, April 3rd is Friday, April 3rd, 33 AD was the day that Jesus was cut off. 
So I know that's getting awful technical, and I'm not going to come out dogmatically and say, and that's the truth. Remember Edith Ann on her big rocking chair? She'd say, and that's the truth. I'm not going to say I know that exactly, but I'm just saying a lot smarter people than me sat down and calculated all this out, and they said, hey, listen, we, we believe we have the day the command went forth, and if you add 173,000 some days, you're coming right into 33 A.D., and other, you know, other people think Jesus died in 30 A.D. They calculate a little differently, but that's okay. we got the general time, everybody. We've got it basically figured out really close. And by the way, Israel, there's no excuse for them not knowing the time. Remember Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you did not want me? He says, because you missed the day of your visitation. You missed the day of your visitation. In other words, the time. Your Bible told you I would be visiting you, and you blew it, Israel. You blew it. Okay? So that's number five. Now, after that, after those 69 sevens, after the 69 times uh, seven equals 483 years, this brings us to number... Uh, Six, after 483, and that's, again, those are prophetic years, that's Jewish years of 365, or 360 days each, Messiah would be executed. He would be executed. He would cut off. You say, boy, Pastor, but that's a rough word to use, execution. Daniel 9, 26, it says, after 62 weeks, after the 483 years, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Now, let me just say this. That, but not for himself, sounds really lofty and wonderful, but that's not really, it, it's, it sounds like it's saying, Jesus will be crucified, but not for himself. That's not what that exactly means in Hebrew. And again, you've got to realize, everybody, when people are translating a Bible from Hebrew to English, you know what, sometimes it's just tough. They're looking at the Hebrew text, and it's not as clear as it ought to be. But most people see this phrase, but not for himself means, and I think I put it in your notes, he'll be cut off and have nothing. He'll be cut off and have nothing. That's kind of what it means. And I'll come back to that. But I told you earlier, the phrase cut off was used for the death penalty in Leviticus and often referred to violent death. And I put some scriptures there for you. The phrase cut off was used for the death penalty. Jesus experienced the death penalty for you and I. He wasn't shot by a bunch of people with guns. He wasn't put on a guillotine and had his head decapitated. They didn't cut his head off with a sword like uh, Boko Haram or like uh, ISIS or something like that. He was executed by the Romans, which was their modus operandi was crucifixion. Okay? He was cut off, but not for himself. He would not have what properly belongs to Messiah. He'll be cut off and have nothing. He doesn't get what Messiah should have gotten. What do you mean, Pastor Bob? Well, he should have gotten a crown of gold and precious jewels as the Messiah, but instead he got a crown of thorns. He should have had a royal robe given to him on Palm Monday, but instead he was stripped of his clothing. He should have gotten a royal throne to sit on. They should have made a throne for him more beautiful than any throne that's ever been made. But what was he given? He was not given a throne to sit on. He was given a cross to hang on. And what should he have had? He should have had a reception as Israel's savior. But what did he get? He got rejection and scorn. That's what it means. He'll be cut off and have nothing. He's just rejected of men, a man of sorrows. Okay, number seven. We'll go quickly here. Just have a little bit more to go. Number seven, after Messiah's execution, Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. 
Um, Gabriel told Daniel, after Messiah dies, you're going to pay a price. You're going to pay a price, Israel. And boy, did they ever. Boy, did they ever. Let's read this in verse 26. And the people, I'm going to start there right here in the middle. And the people, okay, let's stop there. In your notes, does it say what those people, who they are? Does it say who they are there? Did I put it in there? Thank you. Okay, it's in there. Good. So you don't have to write it in. And the people, the Romans, the ones who put Jesus on the cross, they were the empire then. Gabriel says, Daniel, the people of the prince who is to come. By the way, it wasn't the emperor himself that came into Jerusalem and destroyed it from 66 to 70 A.D. It wasn't the emperor of Rome who was sitting on the throne in Rome. It was his son, Titus. The prince, the people of the prince who is to come. The Roman people of Prince Titus of Rome. Not a Roman king. He was simply the prince, the son of Roman emperor Vespasian. That prince will come and those people will come and they'll destroy the city and the sanctuary. When did that happen? 70 A.D. Gabriel predicted it 600 years earlier and it came to pass. After Messiah is cut off. Now, does Gabriel tell Daniel how long after Messiah is cut off? No. But he says, after Messiah is executed, Jerusalem is going down. Jerusalem is going down. He'll destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it, the end of what? Israel. Jerusalem. Israel's destruction. The end of Israel as a nation in 70 A.D. shall be with a flood. Okay? It's going to be quick. It's going to be destructive. Approximately a million Jews were killed when Titus swept through there in that war. And then notice that Gabriel tells Daniel, until the end of the war, till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Boy, has, was, were they ever determined. Think about it. Jesus said, when he was on earth, this wall and this temple, they were saying, oh, Jesus, isn't the temple in Israel so beautiful? He said, one day there won't be one stone left upon another. He says, when, when the Romans come through, they will knock it down and every stone will be broken apart that this temple is built together with. Desolations. Israel was desolated. It was destroyed. And everybody think about this. It wasn't until a little over 1,900 years later. 1,900 years. In 1948. 1948. Some of you were alive that year. 1948, they became a nation again. So, it's kind of like if you get your head shaved completely, like I had to have half of my head shaved when I got my head, my brain surgery. If you get your head shaved, you know what will happen eventually? It'll, you'll be bald for a while, but then little, little hairs will start to grow. Well, Israel got shaved in 70 AD, but in 1948, the hair began to grow again. They became a nation. People flooded back, kept coming and coming and coming. It was amazing, okay? Jesus predicted this destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, it's in your notes. Jesus said in Luke 21, beginning with verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Now, what's interesting in Luke 21, people struggle because they're reading this, a near prophecy, and then they're reading Jesus' far prophecy, and they kind of struggle with it. You always got to remember, Jesus was a prophet, Daniel was a prophet, David was a prophet, Moses was a prophet, Samuel was a prophet. We could go down the list. There were tons and tons of prophets. And whenever they gave prophecy, many times there were near prophecies and far prophecies. In this same passage, you have the end of the world in the tribulation period that we're still waiting to happen. 
But this already occurred. This prophecy came true uh, 40 years after Jesus died on the cross, just a little less than 40 years. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that it's desolation. Know that it's going to become a ghost town very soon. It's near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, there's going to be people fleeing in the tribulation period as well. Because Matthew 24, Jesus uses these words concerning the tribulation period. But I'm going to show you in just a second why this isn't talking about the very end times. This is talking about 40 years after Jesus. Notice this, everybody. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all, that all things which are written... You can go back to Daniel 9.26. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. But, woe. That means like great sadness, great sorrow. Uh, I'm trying to think of a word that we use that's a good English equivalent nowadays. We don't say woe, woe, woe. Um, <laughs> but, but we might... We might say, whoa, <laughs> or something like when things go bad. I'm I, I know I, in my mind in the past, I know I've had a different synonym there. But anyway, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, Israel, and wrath upon this people. Hey, uh, what did Israel do 40 years earlier that God's wrath has to fall on them and he has to turn Israel, Jerusalem, into a ghost town? What did they do 40 years earlier, everybody? Crucified their Messiah, didn't they? He gave them time to turn back to him, but they didn't turn back. And so what happened? Wrath. Wrath upon this people, Jesus said. Jesus talked about the Jews. He's standing in front of Jews talking. And then he says, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. The million, a million Jews died, but all the rest of the Jews were led captive in all nations. They were taken all over the place on earth. And by the way, everybody, they stayed that way till 1948. They stayed that way till 1948 when God began to bring them back, when God gave them. It's a, it's a miraculous story. I've got a video sometime I would love to show us, uh, but we'll have to save that for later. It's amazing, that story about Israel. But it says, they're going to be led away captive in all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles. Jerusalem, the city, for those Almost 19, or those, a little over 1,900 years, it's getting trampled by the Gentiles. Israel wasn't living in it from the time of 70 A.D. all the way up to 1948. That's a long time, okay? Jerusalem will be trampled by non-Jews until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. When will the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled? When Jesus returns to earth. Who's been ruling over the entire earth? Have Jewish people been ruling over the earth? Well, some people will say, oh, yeah, they've been ruling over the earth and going on and on. No, they haven't been ruling. No, Gentiles have been. Arabs, Americans, British, Indians, Chinese. They're the people that the Gentiles are trampling Israel underfoot. But that won't happen forever. The times of the Gentiles whoosh, are going to end. And then it's time for God's day. All right. So let me go on and tell you what we got to look forward to next week. This is really, this is going to end these nine key points. But next week, the Jews are going to make a covenant. By the way, uh, I think the rumblings may be there right now. It's very possible that things are happening right now. Because what's going to happen, Israel is being highly protected by America right now. And now by Bahrain and by UAE as well. 
But something's going to happen and their protection is going to go south <laughs> and they're going to be in an ex existential threat. That means their very existence is threatened. An existential threat. And they're going to need to make a pack. They're going to need to make a treaty. The Bible calls them covenants. I want to put a scripture up here that I'm, we're going to talk about this. We, this is Isaiah 28, 14, talking about the nation of Israel. We, the nation of Israel, we have made a covenant. We've made a treaty. We thought it was going to be for our protection. No, we've made a treaty with death and with hell. Wow. Whoever they make a treaty with, it's not good. <laughs> They've made a treaty with hell with death and with hell, we are in agreement. That's going to happen, everybody. You say, Pastor Bob, when is that going to happen? I'm guessing. I think it's going to happen when the church is raptured. Could happen before it. There could be a little gap of time there. We, it's hard to determine these things. But I believe that either just prior to or when the church, the day of the rapture of the church, Israel, people will band together and make a covenant. Israel make a covenant with many. And they're going to be in bad, bad shape. So we're going to be talking about that next week and we're going to finish up Daniel chapter 9. It's just fascinating. So let me just do this real quickly. You know, again, the last two, three weeks it's been more, <laughs> it's been more of this than this, okay? I haven't been preaching so much as teaching you going right through these verses very carefully because they're not easy to understand. That's why I want you to have papers. You can go back and look at it again and say, get it in your mind when you read that. Oh, I know what that means. I know what that's talking about. We need that, everybody. So I just wanted to ask, does anybody have a question that you just want to, you just got to have an answer for or something that's happening nowadays? Is there anybody that has that? If you don't, no problem. Because I'll just pray, okay? Daniel, yeah, what's your question? I'll repeat it for the... All right, Daniel asked the question, why did, they, why did uh, Gabriel say there's going to be 62 weeks and, and 7 weeks? Is that right, Daniel? 62 sevens and 7 sevens, okay? Now, why is that? Let me go back. To that scripture real quick. Um, which would be verse, uh, let's see. Okay, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, now the reason that's divided up, Daniel, is if you add 62 plus 7, it's 69 weeks. Okay? So that's the full time that is, uh, that's the full time that covers the command all the way up to Messiah. Now, let's consider, let's think about what that might be. Let me jump over here. And I think I've got handy here. Let's see here. Okay. I'm going to go in this Bible knowledge commentary because I don't have an answer right off the cuff. And I'm going to plug this in here and say if this guy... Okay. Okay. The 490-year period is divided into three segments, 7, 62, and 1. That's 70. 7, 62, plus 1. 7 plus 62 plus 1. That's 70 sevens. Okay, so he said it's divided up. Um, the first period of 49 years may refer to the time in which the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem permitted by Artaxerxes was completed. Okay? Though Nehemiah's wall construction, which was 444 to 395 B.C., 
Though Nehemiah's wall construction only took 52 days, many years may have been needed to remove the city's debris, to build adequate housing, and to build the streets and the uh, moat. Did they call it a moat or a trench? What did they call it in there? The street and the wall. Okay, the street shall be built again and the wall. So apparently, Daniel, that's what that's pointing to, toward there. The, the seven years is the 49 years, and then the other 62 years will be the time between the completion of it up till the Messiah. That's, that's a straightforward answer by uh, the, the author of the, in the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Bible Knowledge Commentary is a commentary that uh, Dallas Seminary put out in 1982. It's an excellent commentary. And I highly, uh, I highly recommend it. It's a great commentary. So, okay, that's a great question, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, and that's important. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes, Daniel, I can't go into minutia because then I'll be speaking for like two or three hours, and by that time, everybody's already taking their Sunday afternoon nap. <laughs> I already do that already. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right. Who else? Anybody else have a, a, any more questions? Otherwise. I'll just end with a, a quick encouragement to you all. When you get to, oh, I see that hand, Brother Bill, on the back row. Next week we come in from Alabama. I pray that 4428 Okay, Isaiah 4428. Okay, I need to make a note of that. Cyrus, okay, yeah, very, okay. Yeah, and Cyrus is our Xerxes. <laughs> Cyrus and Artaxerxes are the same person. Yes, they have, uh, they have different names. So Bill asked in Isaiah 44, 23, Bill? 44, 28. He says, well, it says there, Cyrus. Well, it's because uh, they, they have different, uh, you know, <laughs> they have different names. Like they have multiple names. They have throne names. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They have these throne names. And so uh, probably, and most likely, Cyrus and our Xerxes are one and the same person. So, okay. All right, well, I just want to encourage all of you. Peter in, in the New Testament says, seeing these things that are going to come to pass, these prophet, the prophetic word, how holy should you be in all manner of godliness and holiness. He's talking about how we ought to all stand for the Lord because folks this is coming to pass and we need to be praying we need to be seeking God we need to be touching the lives of others witnessing doing all that we can to help people find Jesus you know what I know that right now we're at the very end and in America not very many people are getting saved anymore but that doesn't mean we give up that doesn't mean we quit that doesn't mean we quit praying for our top 10 list. We keep going. We keep praying for our neighbors. We keep praying for people. And uh, just pray, 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 pray. You know, I prayed for my, my sister for 41 years, but she never came to Jesus. But you know what? That's not because I didn't pray. <laughs> it's because that she didn't listen to what God was saying to her. She kept pushing it away. So we have to keep on keeping on. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you for your word, Father. How fascinating, how amazing, how wonderful, Lord. All these things. Lord, if all these things have already come to pass that we've looked at, that Gabriel told Daniel, so many things about Jesus coming, Messiah the Prince, about the wall being rebuilt and the all of that, Lord, all those things have come to pass. Some of them are waiting to come to pass. But if they've already come to pass, Lord, the other ones will follow. And Father, this world will end exactly the way you said that it will end. Jesus will return. The times of the Gentiles will end. And you will sit on the throne and govern the entire world, Lord. Father, thank you for that. I pray for your people, Lord. I pray that you'll keep them close to you. I pray for all those that have joined us, Lord. From afar, Lord, they 
have gotten on the internet or on their phones and have listened today, I just pray your richest blessings on them, Lord. And we ask all these things in your precious name and for your sake, Lord Jesus. Amen.